So, uh, so glad to be here this morning. Thanks for that introduction, Ron. I uh, appreciate that. Now, uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, I'm sure you've probably found yourself in a position a time or two in your life where you've lost something and had to look for it. And probably the degree to which you went to really searching for that thing depended on how important it was to you, how valuable it was to you, what it meant to you. And I'm one of those people that has difficulty keeping track of my glasses, sunglasses. Now that I'm older, I have to have reading glasses. And uh, I, I misplace those all the time, so I buy them at the dollar store. So if I lose them, I don't really have to spend all that much time looking for them because they really aren't that important to me, right? But from time to time, I lose something a little bit more important, a little bit more valuable to me. And in those situations, my, my pressing desire to find those things is elevated. And I find myself searching for that lost credit card or my lost car keys or my lost wallet or my lost cell phone, whatever the case may be. But even those things can't compare. I remember years ago, many years ago, uh, I was at Disneyland with uh, some of my friends. And uh, this couple had uh, two children. And one of them, the little one, his name was Jason. He was about three years old. And I remember as we were walking through Disneyland, spending time, having a good time, all of a sudden I heard from behind me, I heard the, uh, the mother, Sharon, say, Tyler, do you have Jason? And I turned around and I looked at Tyler, and I could tell Tyler had no idea where Jason was. And she looked at me, Terry, do you know where Jason is? And she could tell by the look on my face, uh, I, I don't have him. And in the moments that ensued, she screamed, Oh my God, we've lost Jason. And she took off running and screaming at the top of her lungs, Jason, Jason, Jason. And I remember Tyler took off in one direction, and I went the other direction, and we searched frantically for Jason. And what seemed like an eternity was about 10 minutes. We found Jason. And I can tell you, I can still remember and recall the, the look on Sharon's face. I could still see the tears of joy flowing down her face as she cried and said, Thank God, thank God, as she hugged her little boy, Jason. Now today we're going to be looking at a chapter out of the book of the Bible in Luke chapter 15. And in this chapter it deals with lost things. And in this chapter we're going to see how God, how important these lost things are to God. And in what depths he goes to recover those who have walked away from him foolishly, wandered away from him foolishly, those have, who have neglected their relationship with him carelessly, and those who have rebelliously just flat out walked away from him. I want to go ahead and throw uh, our passage up on the screen. And I noticed that uh, when I told Juan the, the scripture, I, I failed to uh, include the first several verses. So I don't think that this, yeah, this actually starts in verse 4. So I'm going to start off reading in uh, verse 1 here, and then we'll pick up 4 up on the screen. And uh, see, got the cheaters. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7 says, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him and listening to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now you guys know the Pharisees and the scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were guys who were always getting it wrong about Jesus. But this is one of these situations where they actually got it right. Did you hear what he, they said? They said about Jesus... This man receives sinners. And I, for one, am so glad that he does. Because I'm one of them. And so are you. So he told them this parable saying, What man among you, and you can follow along with me now, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, and that's important. Rejoicing, And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the time, for the people that are here. I just pray, Father, that uh, today as we continue to learn about the, the reality that there are no perfect people in your house, that you will use this message today. You will use me, a broken vessel, to pour out to these other broken vessels here today. A message that will help them understand the love that you have for them, the depths to which you go, to search out for them and to find them and to bring them to you. And I pray, Father, that in this message today, we'll truly see what our hearts desire in you and from you. And I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I want you to note, out of the passage that we just read here, in response to being accused of 
cohorting with sinners, Jesus decides to tell a parable. And I want you to note that he's, the Bible says that he told this parable. Singular. Not plural. And I say that for a reason, because so many, read, so, so many people read Luke chapter 15, and they view this as three separate parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. But they were never intended to be told separately. They were intended to be told all together as one parable, because they all represent the three ways in which God seeks out that which is lost. So it is, in essence, one song with three verses. And in the first verse, we see the shepherd who represents Jesus Christ. So we see the work of Jesus Christ in recovering that which is lost. In verse 2, we see the work of the bride or the woman who represents the work of the Holy Spirit through the bride of Christ, the church, and recovering that which is lost. And in the final stanza, final verse of the song, we see the illustration of God's hand in recovering that which is lost. So I want you to notice that um, Jesus began with this illustration. Of course, the, the very first part, very first verse here is about the shepherd. A shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one. And like this shepherd who loses one sheep, Jesus too goes out and searches for that lost sheep, leaving the 99 behind. And I think people would be a little bit questioning of that. Okay, so one wanders away and you're going to leave the 91, 99 good ones all to themselves? What about them? What about protecting them? Well, you have to understand kind of how shepherds worked and how they, how they uh, worked together. And when a shepherd would lose one of his sheep, he would take all the, the whatever he had, and in this case 99, he would take the 99 where all the other shepherds were with all of their sheep, and he would say, watch my 99 while I go out and search for this one who was lost. So while we may think it's a little bit foolish to leave 99 behind to go look for one, we only think that until we're the one, right? Because when we're the one, we go, yeah, you better come looking for me, man. So just like the good shepherd, and, and, and we know that in John chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as what the good shepherd in one of his many I am statements. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for his sheep. I am the good shepherd, and my, sh my sheep know me, and I know them. Right? So I want you to, uh, to notice with me that uh, the shepherd went out, and, and, he, and he looks for, and he finds that, and, and uh, the sheep, and he brings them home. And I want you to note the celebration that occurs when he brings home the sheep. And the, and the Bible says that just like this lost sheep that is recovered and brought home and people celebrate, and there is great joy in heaven, great celebration going on in heaven whenever a sinner repents and returns to God. And I think there would be a temptation amongst us to say, you know what? If I can be the source of great celebration in heaven, maybe I'll wander away every now and again so that I can come back and be that source of celebration. And if we fall into that mentality, you have to understand the problems that go along with that. Because when a shepherd had a sheep that continuously wandered away, as some of us are prone to do, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Remember that old hymn, prone to wander? So when sheep were prone to wander, a shepherd would do this. He would have a number of tools with him, of course, a staff and a sling like David had. But he had a small asp, usually about 18 inches long. And the shepherd would do this. When he found a sheep that continually wandered away, the shepherd would break two of the legs of the sheep. Animal cruelty, cry the activist. Put all shepherds into jail, cries PETA. But that's only because they failed to understand, and they're speaking out of ignorance, because they failed to understand that the shepherd is not breaking the legs of the lamb out of anger, not even out of discipline, but out of love. Because if that sheep begins to wander and continues to wander, eventually the ravenous wolf is going to get him. And the same is true with us. If we continue to wander, guys, it won't be long before the ravenous wolf, and I think you know who that is, will get us. So if you think about wandering away from God, and you think, well, maybe I can do that little sin and that little sin, then I can come back and be okay with God because he forgives me and he loves me and I'll be all right. You need to think, snap, crackle, pop, as the bones begin to break. You need to, you need to think about how many broken legs you're willing to endure. And I want you to also understand that the, 
The people who say that's cruel, that's terrible, that's horrible, need to understand that what would happen. Because as the shepherd would break the legs of the sheep, and as you saw in the passage, it says he carried him on his shoulders back rejoicing. And that's what the shepherd would do. The shepherd would carry the sheep on his shoulders until his legs would heal. And so close would the bond between the shepherd and the sheep grow during that time that when the legs healed, the sheep would never wander again because he had such a close bond. And I think we can, many of us, probably relate to that. I myself, I'm sure some of you too, have wandered from time to time away from God and you've had something broken. Maybe it's a broken heart. Maybe it's a broken leg. Maybe it's something within you that's been broken. But Jesus picked you up and he carried you through and as a result of that relationship that you had with him, as a result of that bonding that took place, your desire to wander was greatly decreased. The parable continues. So we put up uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. It continues, and it says, or what woman? So again, one parable says, or what woman? So first we're talking about a shepherd, or now we're talking about a woman. If she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the lost, uh, the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there will be joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, you know, for me personally, when I lose a coin, I don't really care. Because I, I'm usually trying to get rid of my change. When they give me change, I put it in a little thing, you know, March of Dimes or whatever it is there, because I just don't like having that loose change in my pockets, you know. But you have to understand why the, there's such panic in this woman because she lost a coin. Well, she's got nine other ones. What's the big deal, right? Well, to understand this, you have to know that the ten coins represent very, something very special to this woman because this woman happens to be a bride-to-be. And the ten coins were something that were worked for for a very long time. So they had not only financial impact, but they had sentimental impact because the ten coins represented basically what today would be a wedding band or a wedding ring, an engagement ring for a woman. And any woman who's lost her ring can attest to how horrible this feels. You can certainly understand the the need to sweep through the house and search for it until she finds it and calling my friends saying, I can't find my wedding ring. Come and help me look. And then find it and calling him and say, never mind, I found it. I found it. But I wanted to point something out to you about the coin. The reality is a coin is worthless. It's absolutely worthless unless it's in the hand of somebody who can put it to use. I mean, if a coin is in the bottom of the ocean or worse yet, in the crevices of the minivan, Because then it's lost forever. You never get it back. But if a coin is, is lost in the minivan or it's lost in the ocean, it's absolutely worthless until it's returned to somebody who can put it to good use. And the same is true of people. People are worthless. Not that they don't have value. I mean, people have talents and things of that nature. They have value. But they're worthless unless they are in the hands of the one who gives them worth. I think if you uh, remember the situation where the Pharisees came to Jesus trying to trick him, asking him about taxes, saying, uh, should we pay taxes to the Romans? And Jesus, you know the, the story. Jesus, so clever, man. I love this. He says, well, give me a coin. So he takes the coin and he says, whose image is on the coin? And people will say, well, Caesar's. And he says, well, render to Caesar that which is Caesar and render to God that which is God. And we think, bravo, Jesus. Great job. Great answer. Very tricky, very clever. We like that. And a lot of people look at that and think, well, that's just basically saying that we need to abide by the government and give to the government what the government requires of us. And we need to give to God also what God requires of us. But I think it's much, much bigger than that, guys. I think, it's, I think if that's all we see, then we miss the point. Because he's saying, whose image is on the coin? Caesar's. But whose image is on man? Let us create man in our own image, said God. So whose image is on us? God's. So who do we belong to? God says, look, the coin was made by man for man. Let him have it. But render to me, render to God, that which is mine. I place my image on each and every one of you. 
and you belong to me. But apart from me, you are worthless. For apart from God, the Bible says, we can do nothing. One last thing I want you to see about this, uh, this set of verses about this woman, this bride. Whenever you see a bride in the Bible, always look for ways in which this bride speaks to the great bride of Christ, the church, us. And certainly that's true in this passage here because this bride absolutely speaks of the bride of Christ. Because it is us that God uses, quite frankly, in uh, this second stanza of this verse to bring lost people back to him. And how does he do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling in each and every one of us with the gifts and abilities that the Holy Spirit has imparted to us. Maybe your gift is, you have a great gift of prayer. And you're a prayer warrior. And you're going to pray that person who's lost back into the kingdom. Maybe your, your gift from the Holy Spirit is the gift of counseling or prophecy. And you're going to share somebody the word and you're going to share wisdom with somebody. And, and because of that, God's going to use you and you're going to use that situation to bring that lost soul back to him. Maybe you, you stand up here and you sing a song. A song that speaks to the heart and soul of somebody who's sitting in the auditorium today who's lost. So through the bride of Christ, the Holy Spirit works through each and every one of us to bring lost souls back to him. That's the job of the Holy Spirit, to sweep through the world, recovering the lost coins, if you will, us, you, me, all mankind, and putting them, placing them in the hand of the one who gives them worth. Luke chapter 15, beginning in uh, verses 11, we'll continue our story with the third verse of this uh, wonderful song. And he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me. I want you to remember that. Father, give me. In, in the uh, New King James, it says, Father, give me my share. And here it says, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and, began, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him to his fields to feed swine. Excuse me. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now note this next part. Make me as one of your hired men. And I love a, another version of the Bible that I, I read. It just says, make me your servant. So initially he's, he's saying, Father, give me my share. And later he's saying, Father, make me your servant. So he got up and he came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, and this is, this is beautiful, so beautiful. The father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us celebrate and eat. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now, this is probably the, you know, one of the most popular passages in all the Bible. Thousands, maybe millions of sermons that have been taught on this because it's just so easy to teach on, quite frankly. And there was a survey that was taken a number of years back where they ask all these literary scholars, what is the, the greatest short story of all time? And by 70%, secular scholars voted the prodigal son as the greatest short story of all time. Because the, the telling of a great short story is based on how many times you can tell it and still be impacted by it, still have impressions from it, still learn new things about it. And that is certainly true. I certainly have found that to be the case in the story of the prodigal son. 
I can't read the story of the prodigal son without being moved in some way. Sometimes it's because I'm relating to the prodigal. Sometimes it's because I'm relating to the older son. But most often it's because so clearly in the passage of Luke chapter 15 in the story about the parable of the prodigal son, I see so clearly the love of God for me specifically that it's seldom I can read through it without being moved to tears. Now I want to make sure that you see why the prodigal son became a lost son. Because prodigal means wasteful and indeed it is wasteful for anyone to say to the father, I only want what I can get from you but I don't really want a relationship with you. And that's the position that the prodigal son was in. And it's a position I think that quite frankly many of us find ourselves in. So his, his downfall, guys, I want you to understand this. His downfall was not in asking for his share of the estate. His downfall was in that he left the presence of the Father. And that's always the downfall for every one of us. Because when we leave the presence of the Father, we are now prone to sin. Because the Father keeps us from sin. And the reverse is true as well. Sin keeps us from the Father. So his big mistake was wandering away from the Father, placing himself no longer in the presence of the Father, but placing himself in a position where he would be tempted to sin and then did sin. And as a result of that, he falls into complete, completely being impoverished, complete poverty, and then famine. And that's always the way it is, guys. When we walk away from God, we will experience something. And it's not a pleasant something. For a time, great times, man. Because sin is fun, fun for a season. But eventually will come the consequences and you will feel a famine in your life. Whether that's a physical famine or not. In most cases, it's not. It's a spiritual famine. Because deep down inside, it's not the things of the world we desire. It's God that we desire. And this is where, this is where the prodigal son completely missed out. Because he wanted what was in the hand of the father. And so often, that's who we are too, as evidenced by our prayers. Father, give me that loan so I can get that new truck. Father, give me that loan so I can buy that house. Father, make her love me again. Father, heal my bunions and my feet. Father, fix my life. Father, make this right, make this better. Father, give me, Father, do, Father. So we are constantly looking and thinking that what we want from the Father is the hand of God, when in reality... What our life really craves, what our soul craves, is not the hand of God, but the face of God. It's not what we get from God. It's God himself. It's him. And so often we completely miss out on that. Now I want you to note that... Uh, I don't know if I have time for the story or not, so... Yeah, I think I do. It's kind of like this. I'll give you an illustration. I used this illustration once uh, years ago in a teaching, and I think it's really appropriate for, for this teaching. It's all about being in the presence. Because sometimes when we think, we think we're not feeling and, 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 and experiencing the blessings of God, that God has somehow shut off the faucet, the valve of his blessings from us because he's disappointed in us, he's angry with us, he's upset with us. And there certainly is an aspect and an element of God's discipline in our life. But it's not that God's blessings stop flowing. It's that we have taken ourselves and removed ourselves from the presence of where God's blessings flow. So it's kind of like this. Imagine you and me decide to go on a trip. You and me have always wanted to go to Niagara Falls. So we hop in a car and we drive 2,000 miles across the United States and we get to Niagara Falls. We get there bright and early when everything's ready to open. And as we get out of the car, suddenly a goose comes walking by. And you see the goose and you go, dare you, goose. I go, yeah, it's, it's a goose, but we're here to see the Niagara Falls. Yeah, I'll be right with you. And you start following the goose. And the goose takes off, and you follow the goose for hours and hours. You're out following the goose all through the desert, all through the wilderness, and, and away from Niagara Falls. And for hours and hours, you follow this goose where you finally come to your senses and go, what am I doing? And you come back to the parking lot where I'm getting ready to get in the car. And you say, wait, wait i, I got to go see Niagara Falls. And I say, dude, they're closing. It's, it's, it's closed. It's done. You missed out. 
And why did you miss out? Because you were off on a wild goose chase. <laughs> Guys, that's what life is like. We get off on these wild goose chases, chasing things that, that have no meaning. But the fact of the matter is, where the blessings flow at Niagara Falls, it's continually flowing. We just haven't positioned ourselves in the perfect place to experience the blessings of God. So when we walk away, it's not like God is going, Oh, it's off. Oh, you're back. It's on. Oh, you're away. It's off. Oh, you're back. It's on. No, the blessings are, continu are flowing continuously. We just have to place ourselves where those blessings are, and those blessings are at the feet of Jesus, at the throne of God. Now, I want you to uh, note that when the son comes to his senses, his uh, first thought is, you know, I'll go back to my father, and maybe he'll let me be a slave. No thought whatsoever that he will be a son again, but he thinks maybe I can be a slave, and at least I'll have food in my stomach, and I can survive. So he, he practices this, this speech that he's going to give to his father when he gets back. And when he's on his way back, and this is my favorite part of the story, as he's on his way back, the Bible says, when he was a far way off, and this tells us the, the heart of the father, who is continually looking for us to return to him, right? So he, long way off, the Bible says, doesn't say long way off, and the father sat back on his chair and said, well, we'll see what he has to say. The Bible says that he was a long way off, and the father girded up his robes, and he ran to his son. It's the first and only time you'll ever see in the entire, in the entire Bible where you see God in a hurry. And so he runs to, the, to, to his son, and, and when he gets there, what does he say? He doesn't say, hey, where have you been? What have you been doing? Why haven't you written? You haven't even texted me. What's going on? The Bible says that when he saw him, he embraced him, which is important. Because the Bible said for the Hebrews, the Jews, that when a rebellious son returned, he was to be stoned. So the father was putting his embraces around him, saying, he's protected, he's okay, he's mine. And the, and the son starts to give his little spiel. And I, and I love it because he, he, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but the father. So the father, he's not even listening, man. It doesn't even matter what he has to say at this point. He's, he's, oh, did you say something to the son? Why? Because he's telling the slaves, he's giving direction to the slave, to the, to the slave saying, hey, quickly, get him the best robe. And whose was the best robe? The father's was the best robe. So he's going to give him my robe and put a ring on his finger, which was significant because it, it signified authority. Put sandals on his feet, which was significant because the slaves didn't wear shoes. So he's, clearly announcing to everybody and to his son, you are not going to be a slave. You are to be my son. So the son returns thinking he's going to get a beating, but instead he gets a blessing. How often we think that that's the case with us in our relationship with God when we wander away, that God's going to be so disappointed when we return, that somehow we have to work really hard and fix things before we return. But God says, no, just come back. Just come back. And I'll embrace you. And I'll put you in the position, not of a slave, but of a son. I want you to go back and think about the requests that were made by the prodigal of his father. The first one being, give me my share. And the second one being, make me your servant. The fact of the matter is, I think all Christians fall into one of those two places in life. And we are either people who are saying, Father, give me my share. Or we are saying, Father, make me your servant. And the question for each one of us is, which one am I? Am I a follower of Jesus who says, give me what I've got coming to me, bless me? Or am I saying, Father, do whatever you have to do with me. I am your servant. The passage continues in uh, verse 25 um, with the older son. Now the older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And the father came out and began pleading with him, 
But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice, not my brother, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, was lost, and has been found. Now, if we refer to the younger brother as the prodigal son, I think it's only appropriate that we refer to the older son as the plotting son, because that's what the older son was doing. It would seem from all outward appearance that the older son was the better of the sons, the son who would be more beloved because he stayed home with the father. He didn't leave. He didn't take his, his share of the wealth and go and squander it foolishly. But notice where he was when the father is welcoming back the son. Notice where he was when the father is celebrating and rejoicing the one who was lost is found. Notice that he had no clue whatsoever about the heart of his father. And I'll submit to you that there's a reason for that. I submit to you that he fell into, the older son fell into the same kind of situation that the younger son fell into. He's busy plotting away. He's busy seeking success. He's busy, busily busying himself, trying to get ahead, working hard to show his father that you made the right choice. I am a good son indeed. I am well deserving of all that you have given me and then some. He too, I think, fell into the same mistake of thinking that it is the hand of God that he sought as opposed to the face of God. And I say that for a number of reasons, none of the least of which is the fact that when he, when he tries to guilt the father into this whole thing, you know, again, you know, he, he, has, he has no clue why the father's heart is so strong for his son. So obviously he hasn't spent time to know that the father day by day was looking, searching, seeking for the son. If he'd have spent time with the father, he'd have known that the father's heart was broken because of the lost son. And when he tries to make his father feel guilty, the father's reply is so perfect. He says, son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. In other words, he says, son, I've been right here the whole time with you. You've had the very best I have to offer. You've had me the entire time. And if you wanted a goat, son, a goat, all you had to do was ask. I'd have given you a thousand goats. Now, personally, at various times in my life, I have found myself relating to the prodigal son. And at times I have found myself relating to the plotting son. Because at times, like the prodigal son, I've foolishly wandered away. Like the prodigal son, I have foolishly and negligently neglected my relationship, carelessly neglected my relationship with the father. And at one time, when I was a young man, I rebelliously walked away from the father. So I can relate. I can relate to the prodigal, but I can also relate to the plotting son. I can relate to the plotting son because I find myself on a number of occasions working hard, doing the very best that I can. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. But when that becomes the focus, when that becomes the, the goal and the objective is working hard, look, God, look what I'm doing. I'm doing great things. Why aren't you blessing me? And he says, I'm right here. I am your greatest blessing. Spend time with me. Now, I don't like being the, plot, uh, the prodigal. And quite frankly, I don't like being the plotting. But what I really love is the third son in the story. You say, the third son? The Bible said the man had two sons. I'm referring to the son who's telling the story. And if we have a prodigal son and a plotting son. We also have the perfect son who's telling the story to us today. And although 
I can relate to the prodigal, and sometimes I'm him, and I can relate to the plotting son, and I can relate to him because sometimes I'm him. It's only when I relate with the perfect son that my desire to be a prodigal or a plotter is completely obliterated. You know, if you're here today and you're lost, I have good news for you. If you're a prodigal, I have great news. If you're a plotter, I have wonderful news. If you've wandered away from God due to foolish choices, careless attitudes and actions, or a rebellious heart, I want you to understand that if you're here today and you are a prodigal son, return. And if you're a plotting son, rejoice. For the perfect son, Jesus Christ, has made a way for you to run into the embrace of your heavenly father. Take advantage of that, okay? Let's pray. Father God in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for an amazing parable of lost things, lost things that represent us, a lost sheep. Father, you you compare us to sheep, the dumbest animal in the kingdom, and for good reason, because we wander so foolishly away from you, chasing things that are so meaningless, often wild goose chases, thinking that somehow those things are going to satisfy us, and when we get them, Father, we realize they don't. Father, may each of us realize today that it's not the things from your hand that satisfy us. It is your face. It is you. May we desire time with you. May we be passionate about you. And Father, if we wander and stray, I pray that you will bring us back. And I pray, Father, I know you'll bring us back. And I pray, Father, that you have to break a leg or two along the way. I pray that you'll do it. And I pray that in the the course of carrying us and lifting us through those situations, Father, I pray that that bond grows so strong and so so secure, Father, that we will never wander away from you again. I pray, Father, for each and every person that is here, whether they're prodigal plotting or whether they are in the perfect place right now to receive your blessing, sitting at your feet, sitting at the feet of Jesus, sitting at your throne. I pray that we will not wander from that and we will understand, Father, that uh, your love for us I thank you because uh, each and everything that is lost, that is found, is lo- is found simply because you love us, not because we've deserved it, not because we've earned it, not because somehow we're, we're so cool and neat, but simply, Father, because you love us so much that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, the Good Shepherd. I thank you that he is not only the Good Shepherd, but he is the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If we have sin in our lives today, Father, I pray that we will turn from it, repent, and seek you. And I pray, Father, that if we are busying ourselves with the things of this world, we will re- return to you and rejoice that we have you. I thank you, Father, again for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, as you leave here today, I hope that you'll take with you some things from this wonderful parable about lost things lost sheep, lost coins, lost sons. And understand that God desires to have a close, personal, intimate relationship with you. He doesn't just desire to bless you with things. He desires to bless you truly with his presence. And you get to come into the presence of God each and every day through prayer and through reading the Bible. So I pray that you'll do that this week. Read your Bible and pray each and every day. You guys have a great day.